So this is up, and supposedly people will come back. Pausing it would be a lot better than they don't have to leave and come back. And there were 12 of them. Here they come. Okay, good, good. Well, oh, well, that's exciting. A student finally helped me figure out what I'm doing wrong about Zoom. So I can pause things so I can finally, they should be automatically muted so they aren't annoying one another with crying babies and such. So hopefully the online attendees <coughs> will have a better experience now. So did you add a Project Zero or is that a hack? Uh, no, I really is a Project Zero. That's in 127. Because what happened is I wrote all these projects and I found out that there were some people that didn't know any assembly code and in my other classes I found out people didn't know any Linux and such. So I ended up adding projects to classes that were already full of projects. Anyway, we're here. All right. So, all right. So NetFinds is this system to uh, refer to objects on a local area network um, to share files and critters was the original purpose. So every object has to have a NetBIOS name which is up to 15 characters and one last character that's used to say what type of object it is, and it has to be unique on a network. So if you name something printer one, there can't be another printer one on the same network, and that's why it doesn't scale to the internet, it's only ever intended for local area networks. The suffix is a single byte that determines whether you have a computer or other objects, and one object is elected to be the master browser See, in MS-DOS networks, every single object would broadcast every 10 seconds. I'm a printer. I'm a printer. So you always knew where everything was, and the network was all full of broadcast chatter. And as networks got bigger, this was a problem, all those broadcasts. So to get rid of it, they will elect a master browser, and the master browser will keep a master list of all the devices on the network, sort of like a domain controller. Every device, when it boots up, just tells the master browser I'm here, and every other device asks the master browser if something is there. The problem is it can take up to 12 minutes for the master browser to update, and it can take up to 12 minutes for your computer to update from the master browser, so your network information can be 24 minutes out of date. So this was pretty awful. Um, anyway, another thing Microsoft added, which I would love to have an explanation for, because I cannot imagine what thought process led to this, is the null session. If you would connect to a shared device on a Windows network, you would say, you're not authorized. You have to log in. And you log in with an empty password and an empty username. And now it recognizes you and lets you in. Now, who ever thought that credentials like that could give you some privileges? No one knows. But this led to the null. And if you connect with those empty credentials, you get access to a lot of information that you have no business having not just shared files and folders, which might make some sense. You get a list of users and groups. If they rename the administrator account on any machines, it will just tell you the new name. So that was a common security recommendation on Microsoft, rename the administrator account, but the null session will just tell you the new name. It'll tell you the currently logged in user. It will tell you their security identifiers, which is the new number used to uniquely identify them on the network. This was so bad that Server 2000 actually had a vulnerability where you could take over any machine as administrator over the internet with no password because the SID was predictable. And Microsoft found that internally and passed it before it was actively exploited. But it's just amazing how bad this is. So then you can use NBT stack to enumerate it. You'll see a list of machines on your network and uh, whether they're file servers or not. You can use NetView to um, show whether there are shared resources on the host. So if you net view, it'll show you the server, and if you're sharing something, then you can net view with an IP address, and it'll show you this is sharing the My Documents folder, which is a disk folder on there. Um, you can do net views to connect to a machine and, and connect to the, the files in a shared folder. Um, and there are other enumeration tools, including the Kali like SMB 4K and Num for Linux. And there are vulnerability scanners that do include enumeration steps. Like I mean, uh, Nessus and OpenPass. So in college and um for Linux, it will show you that this machine is on a work group and uh, its IP address and what folders it's sharing. And DumpSec is another enumeration tool. There's been, I haven't heard people using it in years, but it's out there. And you get a lot of permissions information and policies and rights. You even get information about like how often passwords have to be changed and how long passwords have to be. Very strange information to give you with their credentials like null and null. Hyena is another one that will show you uh, what's available, enumerating available resources on a Windows network. 
Oh, that's a pretty old one, I think. And commercial, but when you pay for things, you get the pretty GUI display instead of having like Nmap text coming down the screen. Um, Nessus is, of course, the most famous, most popular vulnerability scanner. And it has a paid version, and you get quite a lot of functionality for free and get academic licenses free and such. So it will scan not only clients, but also cloud services. It's really quite up to date, it has all the cool features. OpenVAS is the open source uh, fork of Nessus, um, which is very similar, and you can use it to enumerate Linux. And Unix, uh, Unix has many, many versions. Um, BSD is one of the main ones from Berkeley, but there are many others like HP, the commercial one, Hewlett Packard, and the Apple product, which is Darwin. Um, and they're all very similar. The difference between them is quite small. Um, for all practical purposes, they're all the same, but each one of them has a series of vulnerabilities and patches required. Uh, some student in the 127 class just sent me a vulnerability report showing one of my servers is vulnerable to Dirty Cow, which it totally is. But um, Dirty Cow is a vulnerability that came out about two years ago for all Unix and Linux systems, where there's a race condition and you can elevate your privileges from a limited user to administrator with this attack. There are two versions of it, which one of my students found out to his regret at the uh, penetration testing championship if you run the wrong version, it just kills the server. They killed one of their servers, which cost them some points. Uh, anyway, so uh, if you want to enumerate what shares and other device, uh, other accessible targets there are on a, Windows, on a Linux system, you can use SNMP, which applies also to Windows and to hardware devices like routers. This it turns out, as you can imagine, that you very rarely actually want to go physically to a device to configure it. You want to configure it over the network. If it's a server, it's in the server room, and there's no reason to go in there. You log in over the network. Same thing through Cisco routers and everything. So you often use SNMP. This is the standard simple network management protocol that's used to control servers and firewalls and routers and everything. The problem is it um, started with a very insecure version, SNMP version 2, that would send plain text passwords over the wire. And almost everybody continues to use SNMP version 2 because they have established infrastructure that's only compatible with SNMP version 2. And until you replace that stuff, you have to keep using the old version. Um, and you can use SNMP walk in Linux to go and print out the table. And it's another thing fun about SNMP is if it's available to the whole world, which it should not be, then they can use it to do packet amplification attacks because you can send a small UDP based request and get a large UDP based response. So uh, it's one of the SNMP and Microsoft file sharing on 445 are things that you should always block at the firewall. You should not expose them to the internet. Those services are not safe enough to expose it to the whole world. They should be limited inside your network and to people that come in through a VPN concentrator so you prove they're a real company employee before you connect to them. You don't want the whole world getting to them. They've never been secure enough for that. A finger was the original um, user profile. Before there was AOL or anything, there was Linux systems and Unix servers, and there was a group of people all using the same Unix server. For example, you all work for the same company, and they wanted to send chat messages back and forth and such, and so they used this. You could just finger somebody, you could see their user profile, you could send them instant messages, you could send them IRC, and this was all around um, for a long time. So if you run bigger, it will show you who's currently logged in and how long they've been logged in and how long since they've done something with their keyboard so you know if they're at their desk. It turned out to be quite handy. Um, so if you do Nessus, you can scan Linux. Here's one of the scans I did fairly recently. So it found critical vulnerabilities, ProFTP, multiple vulnerabilities. This is a deliberately vulnerable old adventure machine from the 124 class. So it's got all kinds of bad things, default passwords, root accounts, so on, a bunch of old Unix software, you know, Linux software is not any better than Windows software. Old stuff was written by people before we had any security consciousness and it had default passwords, buffer overflows, and all sorts of foolish things in it. If you run old stuff, you're vulnerable even on a modern system as you found out in the projects. You put on the very latest version of Windows, Server 2016, and then you run some old crappy FTP server and you're vulnerable. Um, the operating system can only do so much for you if you run old software. There are a couple of scanning tools I wanted to add to this lecture that are not in your book, but we've learned them in the advanced classes and the cyber competitions. If you actually are connected to an unknown network and you want to find out what's out there fast, this thing is awesome, much faster than NMAP is NetDiscover. NetDiscover does an arc scan. 
If you run, um, and let me just talk about this. If you haven't come across this, it's a net plus. If you open Wireshark, which is the best way to learn all kinds of networking, and you look on the network, you'll see I got a bunch of UDP packets flying by. And if I now do something like ping google.com, just make this big and ping google.com. Okay, so there I made it to Google. In order for that to happen, I had to do some arcs. So let me stop this. And let's do frame contains Google. Okay, so packet 3135 is where I did a DNS request to find Google. So I'm going to select that one and clear this and look at what happened before that. And I'm getting a lot of UDP, which is probably my streaming video on this machine. But what I was hoping to show you was ARC. Let's see if I can find ARC this way. All right, this is what ARC looks like. You usually see a lot more. Um, who has this tell that address? Every time you connect to anything on a local area network, First, you have to run ARC because my I, my Mac, my network card is configured with an IP default gateway. So to get to Google, I have to go to the gateway, and the gateway is 192.168.11. So I have to ask this question. I guess this summary here is the best. Who has this? Tell me. Before you do any network connection to anything, you have to have an ARC query and an ARC reply to find the MAC address of the object you're trying to talk to, because you can only send packets on a local area network by MAC address. IP addresses don't work. So this means you have to answer ARC requests, or you cannot send or receive any data on your local area network to off the internet. So even if you turn on a firewall and any kind of security device you want, you have to answer ARC requests. So if you just want to scan a network to see what's there, ARC is the fastest and most accurate thing you can do. Anything else might be blocked by a firewall or something. So that's what NetDiscover does. It does fast arc scanning, so it will very quickly find everything on the local area network. The only problem with it is it only works on layer two. So it only works on your local network up to the router. Anything on the other side of the router, you cannot reach by arc. So that you can only use less perfect tools like NMAP that will look for open ports. And if a firewall is blocking you won't, everything, all the ports you test, you won't find. All right, Sparta is another tool that is awesome. More fun than NMAP is Sparta. You just run Sparta, and Sparta does it all for you at once. Automatically scans everything to find everything, and then automatically does NMAP scans, and then automatically tries to find vulnerabilities in a lot of these things. It's not terribly accurate, but it's fun and automatic. So this is turned into the standard in the pen testing contest. The first thing you do is net discover in Sparta before you even think, and it will just scan everything and give you a nice report of what all the services are, and then you can start deciding which one of these looks like the juiciest target to get whatever you're doing and assign them to your team. You try that one, you try that one, and off you go. So I thought I'd mention them as practical tools that aren't in the project for this class, but they probably should be. Maybe when I update this class next semester, I'll switch to these things. Yeah, are they both in Cali? Yeah, they're both in Cali. All right. Yeah, they're both open source and free. Good. All right, so we're now to the last Kahoot, and I'll just clean up and go up to the lab, there is going to be a hacker club meeting down here in about 40 minutes. Um, so that's something you might want to go to. Uh, here's my cahoots. 6B is here. All right. And by the way, I still did not find out who um, Echo is. So if somebody is losing their points, unless they tell them. Occasionally, you get people wandering into artificial students and don't care about points, and that's fine. But if you do care about your grade, you should let me know who you are.
artistic use a 16 character name for each device. <laughs> like a real name too. And M dot, I don't know who that is. Good. Okay, so I got the winners. And um, if you want to do projects down here on your laptop, that's fine. If you want unfiltered internet, we now have a danger zone here running on that router. So if you join this network here, danger zone, with password danger zone, you're connected directly to the internet, bypassing all city college firewalls. So you probably don't need that for most of the projects, but you do need it for like the CTFs. So you might prefer to work down here, but if you want to work up there on those machines, I'll go up there and see what's happening. Um, there'll be a hackers club in here in about half an hour, and then the 127 lecture at one. So I'm going to stop the share. I hear, I don't know, I hear a chat. Perhaps I'm going to find out who Echo is. Ah, Echo, good. Okay, now I know who Echo is. Good. All right, folks, I'm going to stop the share, and I'll be back at one for the 127 class. Okay. Good.